Apologies for being five minutes late, but we're ready to recommence. Uh, just to do a bit of admin, <coughs> we are going to now go to Dairy Australia Limited. That will be followed by Australian Pork Limited, followed by Australian, Australian Live Export Corporation Limited. Then we will return to Corporate I Services. <laughs> Everybody okay with that? Everybody clear? Yes, Chair. Those three re um, research organisations are excited. <laughs> All right, terrific. So Dairy Australia Limited, you're ready to go. Oh, I've got a little bit of a <coughs> thing to say. <coughs> Is that it? Okay. So, representatives from, from uh, Australian Dairy Limited, do you have an opening statement? Uh, yes, I do, Senator Macdonald, which I'd be, uh, which I'd be happy to make. So I'm, I'm Jeff Hodges, the chair, and I'd just like to open by saying that the dairy industry has been through a particularly challenging period over the last three or four years. Um, obviously, widespread drought high feed costs and high water costs in many parts of the industry. But the picture is currently varied across Australia. We are a very diverse industry in many ways. And some areas are less affected and are enjoying record milk prices. And other areas with extended drought conditions are facing a severe lack of profit. Dairy Australia continues to support farmers um, that have to manage their farms. And this includes technical advice, organising events with peers and, and advisors, and one-to-one -one sessions with farm consultants. Dairy Australia continues to invest in a diverse portfolio of activities to advance the dairy industry, from R&D um, to regional extension to industry marketing programs, trade development activities, and a, a world-class sustainability framework. The reduced milk flow of last year and the need to commission additional activities in the regions did, do, did lead to a deficit outcome in financial year 19 of 3.8 million with our budgets. Um, Dairy Australia was prepared for this situation with the capacity to invest reserves. We expect to run a deficit again in the current financial year of around 3.3 million as we continue to support farmers. I think the other, th the other thing to note is that we are working uh, quite strongly with other uh, national organisations on Australian Dairy Plan and we've done extensive consultation with dairy farms in different and, and different parts of the supply chain uh, this year with the intention of resetting strategic priorities for all of those organisations um, for the 21 to 25 period. And the draft um, of that plan is due for release at the end of November. Thank you. Terrific. Thank you. Um, I'm going to ask Senator Roberts, if he has a, or Senator Hanson, I believe one of you had a question for. Yes, uh, I do. I've got questions. Do you want to? Yeah. Okay. Right. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much for coming today. Sure. Um, you've uh, your opening statement. Of course, I've got your annual report here, and you state our purpose is to help farmers adapt to a changing operating environment and achieve a profitable sustainable dairy industry, That's correct. as you have said. Then my question to you is then, what impact has the one dollar milk, <laughs> litre of milk, had on the profitability? Oh, you're joking. <laughs> I'm so yeah, sorry. I, Everyone turns I was, your phone to I was, I was asked about that and I was sure it was on silent. Sorry. Do you want to talk to that, Dave? Uh, thanks, Senator Hanson. The, the, um, the, the extended period in which retail... I'm sorry, would you just start by giving your name and position, My name's please? Dr David Nation, Managing Director <laughs> of Dairy Australia. Thank, Thank you, Senator. Um, one of the challenges with a dollar milk is it was introduced in 2012. Farmers, for 
seven years, there was no change in their price. So it's not just the fact that it was, it was, it was a challenge when it happened in 2012, and it became worse and worse and worse with the dollar milk being held for such a long period of time. It was a, a, an enormous release to dairy farmers earlier this year in 2019 when the supermarkets finally stopped that policy of a dollar milk. But you had Mulaney Dairy that actually refused to sell it at one dollar milk. What did your industry do to help the dairy farmers and put pressure on the uh, Woolworths and Coles and those other outlets that are selling one dollar milk? And we're talking about 2012 up to 2019, seven years? That's correct. And I think what we have to be clear about is uh, all farmer representative organisations worked and I have to commend in particular the Queensland Dairy Farm organisation in what they did to make it really public the damage that was done to dairy farmers. But uh, there's a fundamental difference between the farmer membership organisations like Australian Dairy Farmers and like Queensland Dairy Farmers organisation and who Dairy Australia is. Yep. I know your organisation's made up, you know, levy is only paid by milk producers, so how many were there in, in the 17-18 period and how many are now in 18 and 19? So that's right, you, you collect a levy. OK, we'll go back to this. Your organisation is set up in your research and development. You actually get paid a levy from um, uh, it, milk producers. All right, not those yes. that aren't producing milk, yes. not producers. What was your um, income last year from the levy, from milk producers into your industry? It was a, our total income was of the order of $55 million, no, no, of, no. Which, of which $30 million, of the order of $30 million was from farmer yeah. service levy. Is $33,373,000 about, about the figure? Uh, that, sound, that sounds... Okay. How much did the federal government put in? Uh, sorry, you're talking about this current year of the annual report we're about well, to produce? Or the well, year if you before? give me what's, yeah, up to 2019. Yeah, up to 2019. That'd be lovely. 18, from the year 18, 19. 18, 19 year, the 18, yep. 19 year where the annual report we're about to produce, that, that um, income was of the order of $20 million. 20 million, 528,000. Sound about right? 20 million, this year, 20 million and uh, 58,000, yes. You say that you actually help the farmers and yet you're going to run it at, you've had an income of about $56 million and yet you're going to run in, uh, a deficit with that. Um, can I just ask how many are on the board <coughs> of Dairy, Dairy Australia? There are, there are uh, nine directors but um, including the managing director, Dr Nation. And what, to your, what does the CEO get paid on board and the directors? The CEO has a base salary of around $400,000 plus superannuation. 400000 plus super. And the, and the directors? That's the CEO? The directors have a base fee of uh, 40000 It's 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 slightly more, but it's around... 40,000 plus um, travel costs some sitting and fees for committees and travel costs. Travel costs and... I, as the chair, um, 87,000. Yep. And um, I'm the ex-officio ex member of the two committees, another 6,000 there. Can you tell me what your costs are for your... Um, your I'm specifically interested in Melbourne. You've got an office in Melbourne, is that correct? We've South got an Bank in office Melbourne? Office on South Bank, that's and correct. And what's your rental there a year? Um, I haven't got that. I think we'd have to take that question on notice, Senator. Sorry, I'm sorry, can I share my hmm. to assist Senators and gentlemen and ladies? You've come to Senate Estimates. You don't have any of the basic costings that, are, that, that you face every year at a finger's touch. You must we, we have, have some... I can't believe you've come all the way yeah. from Melbourne and just bought the Woman's Weekly and the TAB Guide. No, it's... It's all there? It's here. But they, Fantastic. They, Let's take the time, Senator Hanson, through you, Chair, and go through this properly. Office rent and outgoings. 
in this last financial year is $686,000. $686,000, that's for the office rent. Yes. So if you take out the CEO plus all the other costs and charges nine, you're looking at, a, at two, three million dollars. So the rest of the money, well, let's say take out six million. So then you've got 50 million you put back into <coughs> the dairy farmers. Would that be right? Yes, in terms of programs. The, um um, well, what I'd like to know is how much money goes back into helping the dairy farmers? You say you want a sustainable industry. You say that so you're actually going out there and literally helping the dairy farmers so with the equipment. I Probably you need to tell me what you actually so we're, do. We, we are an industry services organisation. Yep. So yeah. we, we run, for example, I mean, I mean, yes, we are based on South Bank. We also have a presence through our regional development programs in the eight daring regions of Australia. Murray Darling and others, yep. So that, so that um, we're able to service the needs of farmers in those places and, and um, understand the priorities of farmers in terms of building our programs. And what do and farmers so, seek from you? What do they go to you for? What do they seek from you, help from you in what areas? They seek all manner of things um, mm. to enable them to run stronger, more sustainable businesses and, and develop their people. Well, someone's not doing their job because in Queensland we've actually dropped in 79.80 from 3,052 dairy farms down to approximately about 380 at the moment. We've dropped from, um, there was a national average of 21,994 and 79.80, now we've got 5,699. That was as, as of 17, 18, which is about the figures that we have today. We've dropped from the cattle herds uh, from 2005-06 from 1.88 million down to 1.56 million. So something's not working. Can you explain to me? It's, it's true. Uh, there are less dairy farmers. The, the, average, um, the average size of dairy farms continues to grow, and, and that is a global trend. Yep. I'm, just, I'm just noting that. Um, but the cattle herds are dropped, not just well, the dairy farms. I mean, the national beef herd We've is lost. also at a 20 year low. So, I mean, other sectors have been impacted by the conditions that, that we're operating with across a number of sectors. Yeah. You are actually research and development, so your research must tell you why dairy farmers are actually exiting and there's a, um, less herds now than what they used to be. Could it possibly be because of the cost of the milk they're getting paid by the process, the, what they're getting paid for their milk by the processes? Would that have been a factor? It's true that farmers in all jurisdictions are finding it challenging to be profitable. There, there, are, there are also farmers in all jurisdictions that are generating um, earnings before interest and tax of a dollar to a dollar fifty a kilo of milk solids. There are some, but in all states and regions, um, particularly uh, the northern part of the industry, um, generating those profits has become harder. And that's so. And, and I think that's to a fair degree down to. Um, the feed base within our farm systems mm. uh, in the climate that we are now operating in. Um, I farm in northern Victoria and so um, there have been some quite significant shifts there in our operating environment in terms of access to water, how we produce feed, how we feed cows, the systems that we run. and. Um, we find this in, in many parts of Australia. Through your research and dealing with the dairy farmers, would you support then that they get a fair farm gate price from, for their milk from the, from the processes? Do you want to answer that? The, um, we absolutely 
see the need for a strong milk price for farmers to have a successful farm operating margin. The, our challenge is that the Australian dairy industry uh, exports milk and pr produces more milk than is required for domestic consumption. 35% of milk produced in this country goes into product that's exported out of the country. Effectively, we're part of a global trade. We're part of a, um, a global market. Our challenge, like many agricultural commodities, is farmers are paid a price that's directly related to the prevailing global price for dairy. In saying that, one of the, th one of the absolute strengths of the Australian dairy industry is that there's, um, and even since the year 2000, is there has been growing um, domestic premium. If you look at the trend of what the global prices have been for the last 20 years, and you look at the prices received by farmers over the last 20 years, processes have actually been successful in driving higher farm prices than you would get if you were just operating directly at global commodity traded prices. So there is, there is actually... So a a, they have been successful in doing better than just following the prevailing global prices. So are you telling me that are we tied to some international free trade agreement which dictates the price to what we pay our farmers here? Was that, was that the reason for our deregulation of the dairy industry to accommodate free trade agreements? Is that what you're telling me? No, no I'm, I'm, I'm not saying that. I'm, I'm talking about um, the, 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 the open market that dairy effectively <coughs> operates in, and it is highly informed by what prices companies are able to achieve by exporting their products. And, the Australia, and one, of the, the, one of the fundamental reasons <coughs> why Australia is an open market is because we have a genuine open market with New Zealand. Many what? It, the dairy product, dairy product can move freely between New Zealand and Australia. <clears throat> and, and that is detrimental to our industry here, is that what you're saying? I'm saying that that is also one of the major factors that sets a limit on what um, milk can be traded for in this country. Have, have New Zealand dairy farmers had their property rights stolen, their energy costs blown through the roof, water prices blown through the roof, soil and fertiliser restrictions, with, farm, with state governments and federal governments controlling how they farm? Because there's two sides to this, isn't there, Mr Nation? Profit is price minus cost. We talked about price. What about the damn cost in this country of being a farmer? And a lot of government imposts. Well, I think we're absolutely on the record for saying how it is harder as a dairy farmer to um, make a profit, and definitely has been for the past five years, and we put together an authoritative document called the Dairy Plan Situation Analysis, which sets that out really clearly. Does it analyse the cost of government compliance and dictates and control? It, That's what's killing it. It doesn't, it doesn't make those statements. It just talks simply about how costs have gone up. It's, um, it's free to the reader to sh sh see and show where costs have gone up. So your industry, just get it straight, your industry would support a, a viable farm gate price for the milk solids that are paid for to the farmer by the processor. So I, again, Senator, I just have to clarify the difference between Dairy Australia as an R&D corporation yes, and Australian Dairy Farmers as a, peak, as a peak membership organisation that makes industry policies. You are working. Oh, let me go back to your statement. What's your statement said? Right. Let me. Our purpose is to help farmers adapt to a changing operating environment and achieve a profitable, sustainable dairy industry. That means that they get paid an amount of money for their milk at the farm gate that is going to allow them to be profitable and sustainable. You have admitted here that it has been an impost, an impact on them, that the cost of that. Um, maintaining their industry is not working under the current system. So will your industry, Dairy Australia, support a viable price, farm gate price, for the dairy farmers? 
Again, Senator, the industry position, the industry policy is made by the representative membership groups such as Australian dairy farmers. Dairy Australia is absolutely consistent with the statement in that document you just read out. Our, our challenge is to build business skills. Profitable business comes from money. Profitable means money. Yes. That's so, what it comes to. So business you make it in your statement. That means that you are, you must support them getting a reasonable amount for their, for their dairy product. So what that says as an RDNA organisation is we work extensively to build business skills. We work extensively to innovate and create opportunities for greater operating margins. We work hard on the technical skills of being a farmer and supporting both through innovation and technology transfer and extension the opportunity to earn greater margins as a dairy farmer. It means um, the sustainability framework where we can assure consumers the good work that we do and the way milk is produced and so that consumers are confident in buying dairy products. It means all those things, Senator. Well, then I'll go to it. Here we have, and we've received 33 million levies from the dairy farmers who are paying you per, what, how, how is it calculated? How do they pay you? Every every um, kilogram of protein and every kilogram of fat that is produced in the milk, a levy is applied to. And how much is that levy? That the equivalent of 4.7 cents. Sorry? 4.7 cents 4 .7 per 7 kilo cents of milk per, solids. Per, per kilo. All right. So they're paying you to, to represent them so that they can get their um, a viable, profitable um, amount of money for, the, for their milk. Um, do you want to can, ask can I just be clear, Senator? They're paying us to undertake research, development, extension, marketing and trade activities that advance the dairy industry. S sorry, can you repeat that? They're paying that money to Dairy Australia to yes. advance the dairy industry <coughs> through research, development, extension, marketing and trade development. <coughs> And While they're leaving the industry in droves. Yeah, and clearly, and I just want to put this on the record too. You've actually, in we had in two, 2000, you had at the height, well, at the height, then we produced 12, 12 billion litres of milk. Now at the moment it's about 8.7 billion litres of milk. We've gone from a population of 19 million people up to 25 million people. So we have an industry that's basically declining rapidly, and yet New Zealand has increased its production, correct me if I'm wrong, to about 22 billion litres for a country of four to five million people. Is it possibly, if we keep going the way that we're going, we won't have an industry here that we will be importing our milk from New Zealand? I think it's really important to state Senator, that the industry has declined at the same time as New Zealand has increased. That is, that is a, a, a well-known observation between both countries. It has absolutely been a challenging time to be a dairy farmer in Australia. Uh, New Zealand has its own challenges now as a, dairy, as a dairy industry and is unlikely to grow further from where it is. That's beside the point. They've been through a massive growth phase. They have had an amazing opportunity in New Zealand to expand the, um, the amount of land that is used for dairy production, whereas in Australia, the amount of land that's used for dairy versus other agricultural commodities or from urban encroachment has declined significantly. We'll see what the socialists do in New Zealand now. Does, I, I just want to ask this question. Thank you, Chair. Um, New Zealand dairy is actually regulated, isn't it? And it's actually looked at twice a year by similar to the ACCC, that they actually look at the, what the farmers are paid? There is, there is a Dairy Act in New Zealand and, it's, and it is largely in place because of the market dominance of Fonterra as a milk company. So when they investigate, they're investigating that Fonterra as a dominant player in the market is paying a fair price for the milk. All right. So international trade agreements doesn't affect them because their dairy is actually surviving and if not growing. So they, dairy, New Zealand is a fantastic success story for the global dairy industry, where they have been able to find a successful farm operating margin. And they are even more trade exposed than Australia. So where we have 35% of our product exported overseas, New Zealand has somewhere between 90 and 95% of the, the milk produced in New Zealand is traded overseas. They are completely exposed to the global marketplace 
they have a very large dairy company in Fonterra that is market dominant in New Zealand and manage a lot of that export activity. Uh, as, as, a, as a country, it's, it's organised itself very well and it, it's a, as I say, it's a, a shining light of dairy in the world. What countries do we import dairy products from? We import significant quantities of product from New Zealand and the USA in particular. And the USA? What sort of product from USA? Cheese in particular. Thank you. I just want to ask, if I might just have the Chair's prerogative for a second. Uh, can I talk to you about the, um, uh, the Dairy Sustainability Report? Is that something that you oversee? It is. It is. Terrific. Um, I thought that was a really good initiative that the industry started. I think it was well ahead of any other um, commodity or, or food production market in Australia. So I really congratulate you on the leadership. But there are some concerning um, data in it, which I just draw to Senator Hanson's uh, attention. I'm sorry, Senator Hanson. Sorry, we're just talking about the the dairy uh, sustainability framework, which the um, the dairy farmers and the um, research uh, started five years ago. Would be that long now? 2012-2013. Yeah, yeah, okay. It's got some really interesting stuff in it, and it's really important because it does measure um, profitability, people welfare, price. Um, but one of the interesting things that it does measure, and this concerns me from the beef aspect as well, is that it measures the consumer's belief that dairy forms a healthy, a, an important part of a healthy diet, and that percentage is falling and it's falling constantly in Australia. Yeah. And I think um, so I would be ke keen to hear, what do we do um, as, as dairy and beef and wool and sheep and every other producer in this country, what we, do we do when our consumer um, is turning more to artificial foods, they're eating less real foods? You know, do you have a, a marketing plan around that? Or, yeah, almond juice. <laughs> Uh, I'm sorry, that was my question. You like to, Do you have uh, a plan around that? Uh, I'm happy to start with that answer. Yeah, absolutely we do, mm. Senator. Um, so we, in April this year we launched a new marketing campaign called Dairy Matters. Mm. Um, this data precedes the start of that campaign. Yep. And that campaign is all about connecting with our um, the, you know, the Australian population and yep. dairy consumers. And it's... Um, it's had a... Oh, just excuse me for a moment. Could I just check in? We have a photographer, we have media in the room. Uh, just, has anybody got a problem with being photographed? No. no, thank you. And just a reminder to the media not to go beyond the yellow tagged lines that are on the floor. Thank you. you I'm sorry for interrupting. Yeah. Um, so we are now embarking on a new marketing and promotion campaign, this Dairy Matters campaign. We've, our early tracking has shown that it's... Um, been very positively received by consumers and the Australian population and we expect that to be a really effective um, way of demonstrating the, the genuine importance of not only Australian dairy produce being produced in Australia but the way it's produced is, is resonating with, with the mm. um, That's Australian really important, isn't it? We population. have the highest standards in the world and we should be demanding we're, a premium for that. We're, we're proud of our standards. Excuse me, but mm. I think also got to give credit to Alan Jones, who's constantly speaking up our daring industry and support our daring industry. I think he does a wonderful job. Alan I, Jones as well. I, 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 we, we have to be really... Um, one of the real strengths of the dairy industry is the number of people that speak positively about it. Mm. Chefs, mm. people on radio, farmers themselves. Mm. The, the strongest people, the strongest voice of dairy are the are, are people, there's such a wide range of people that speak positively about the industry. It's, uh, it's fantastic to have that support. Just to finish that thought though, you know, what's imp well, I just yeah. think just to finish on that, sure. what's important about this sustainability report is that as, as, um, as farmers and producers in Australia, we like talking about we have world's best practice and the world's best product. 
but we don't always measure it. And what I'm really impressed by is that you are actually measuring what is the percentage of customer support so that we can keep talking about how much we love it. But unless we do the hard work about what's the reality and then we know what to address and you know what to address as far as research. So I just thought it was important to talk about that. But Senator Stirl is busting to ask a question. So oh, we're I just going to think, move to thanks, that. Chair. And look, we all, I want to eat and, and consume Australian product. All right, but I've got to go back to uh, Senator Roberts' frustration after Senator Hanson's question and line of question. We can talk up our product as much as we like, but if our dairy farming industry is being decimated due to a number of factors, some beyond our control, but when there's price squeezes, when they've been deregulated, it's like our trucking industry hasn't got the ability to stand there and say, hey, all I want is an effective viable, safe, sustainable and profitable industry where I can have cost recovery. We can talk to the cows come out. Maybe I shouldn't use that no, analogy. No. That's probably a bad one. So going back to this, you are a profitable organisation that collects monies from the growers, from the, from, from, the, from the producers. You have a kitty of dollars, which we think is around 30 odd million or whatever, where you've got that through levies. So what I want to come back to where Senator Hanson was going down that path, your remit is a number of things, marketing, R&D and that sort of stuff. Why have you been so opposed to uh, re-regulation of the dairy industry? And these are the people that you take the levies off. <laughs> Um, and Senator, then I'll go back to Senator Hanson to carry on. Senator, the, um, the, the only point that I've made in this discussion is that we haven't taken a position because we see it as the role of um, the peak membership-based organisations to take a position on these matters. Have you been lobbied by the growers, sorry, by the producers, to say, hey, step up to the plate, we want you in our corner? Oh, no, that's not a loaded question, I don't know, have you? Or do the, they not the, talk to the, you about they, their they sustainability? Also, they also respect and understand that um, <coughs> the... Dairy Australia is an organisation, as an apolitical organisation, and is not allowed to undertake political activities. You're not allowed. To, so hang on. When we say, but I don't want to put you in a position, but if you are collecting levies from growers, have they? And I say, the growers, producers, have they come to you seeking your assistance along that? I know the NFF are against it too. I don't know where all the friends of the dairy farmers are coming from, apart from a few senators around this building. And I have to admit, things have changed in the last. Three days, four days, things are starting to step up. Have they said to you, step up to the plate and back us in, we need your help? Is that any conversations? You know, the deference is signing, and they either have or they haven't, gentlemen. Have they? Or they have said, no, no, just no, take no, our no, levies, no, don't no, worry I just, about it. I just waited to see who's going to answer, it, answer the question first, oh, sorry, Senator. Okay, fair enough. So they, 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 they... It looks like it's falling to you, Doctor. Research and development. Research is, you must have an ear to the dairy farmers. The question is, have the dairy farmers come to you as an organisation, you're in contact with them, have they said to you, listen, we've got to get a fair price for our milk solids, please fight for us in any way, possible shape or form, we know you're apolitical, but if you actually have the ear of the minister or the government, will you actually fight for us to get a fair price so that we can stay in the industry and not walk away and have to sell our farms to foreign interests? Have they done that? The, the conversations that we have is that we recognise that you're apolitical and it is our role as peak membership-based organisations to, to take a position and take the conversation up to politicians. That's the conversation that we've had. Perhaps you should just go over your purpose again, what you're supposed to be doing. I just think there's a little bit of... Um, we just need to be clear on what it is your role is as opposed to what the peak body's role is. Yeah. Yes, I think that's terribly important, Senator. Our purpose is to act collectively to, um, through uh, industry good activities like research, development, extension, technology transfer, marketing, promotion, trade and development mm -hmm. to advance the dairy industry. We do that by the collection of our uh, service levy. Where that levy is used for eligible research, development and extension purposes, that is matched on an agreed basis through funds from the federal government. So our focus and that matching arrangement is for research, development and extension. We also are active in, act in areas outside of research and development like marketing and trade development. That's, that is, and that is our role without taking policy positions to, um, to, to government and we support organisations 
with, with science-based um, research and development and um, science-based um, policy research of which they can take facts that we produce and, and make policy positions from that. So, um, so for example, we have market insights as a team at Dairy Australia, and some of the most of the statistics being quoted here today are statistics collected and produced for consumption. Um, the st sustainability framework numbers that you quoted are another good example. So we we describe the market effectively so that people can build effective policy off that information. <coughs> You accept millions from the processes, is that correct? Uh, I think you're talking about a different organisation. So historically, processes, processes have invested in Australian dairy farmers as an organisation, that's not Dairy Do Australia. Do processes pay into Dairy Australia? Processes. Process, so we, we co-invest with processes in some activities like trade development activities. Has processes paid any monies into your organisation, and at that one point may have given you a eleven, given you eleven million dollars? I'm not aware of historic payments by processes, but I think what you're talking about, and that number, sounds to me more like a situation that's happened with Australian dairy farmers, not Dairy Australia. Not your organisation. Not my organisation. Do you know that, Minister? Well, I know that Australian Dairy Farmers is a separate organisation to Dairy Australia. It is. The, you've got um, the members of it. You've got the um, New South Wales Farmers Association, Queensland Dairy Farmers Organisation, South Australian Dairy Farmers it's Association, the representative Tasmania. Body of the Senator, so, so you've got all those organisations part the body of this. That so voted these are for the a mandatory code that we're delivering. These are members of okay. the organisation, Dairy Australian Dairy, dairy, dairy Farmers, dairy not Australia Dairy Australia has to correct me if I'm wrong, okay? Please tell me. Um, you basically have two groups of members. You've got Group A, which is the members, of the dairy industry, the farmers themselves. They actually have a membership through the levy that they pay about th just over 33 and a third million dollars a year into it. Then you have the Group B members, which are all the these dairy organisations. Is that correct? We have two Group B members. That's correct. Right. Thank you. So, and then they actually. Um, that you have also, on top of that, accepted millions of dollars from processes. What is the pro I'd just like to know why the Dairy in Australia, research and development, basically for the dairy industry, here you have the processes. I just want to know why processes are actually paying money into your, organi or your organisation. So what have they got to gain out of it? So our, part of advancing the dairy industry has also been to invest in post-farm gate activities. I just gave trade as an example. We've also invested in post-farm gate rd &E activities historically. That's always been within the remit of Dairy Australia and its predecessor organisations to invest together for innovation that benefits the whole supply chain and ultimately benefits milk price. Our, our ambition is to innovate to, to identify new opportunities to sell a high value product, to deliver a high milk price to farmers. Would there be a conflict of interest because basically out through the whole country there is no code of conduct between the processes and the farmers? So here you have a conflict of interest, don't you? If you've got your dairy farmers that are paying monies into your organisation, you've got processes paying monies into your organisation, don't you feel there's a conflict of interest there? So how can you represent both organisations when they you know, when they basically need a code of conduct so that the processes do the right thing by the dairy farmers in um, their uncomfortable behaviour is, is what's being questioned now at the moment? Senator, as, um, as a background, there is a peak dairy farm organisation, Australian Dairy Farmers, and there is a peak farm um, Sorry, there's a Peak Dairy Products Federation, ADPF. There yeah. are two Group B members, I know, I and, and, and as that. organisations, they're the peak, they, they provide the peak representation of dairy farmers and milk processors. They are the organisations that are in conversation about the code of conduct. They are the organisations that take respective positions to support and advance farmers and processors. I'm fully aware of that, but what I'm saying is, 
You are, your organisation is receiving money from processors. I want to know why. They now, are paying you money into your organisation. Our, our organisation, uh, largely on a project by project basis, receives some money from processors to innovate and to advance the dairy industry so that we can, so that there is a opportunity to sell higher, higher value products in both the domestic and international markets. That is, that is the reason for investing together. And okay. farmers have been substantial beneficiaries from working hand in hand with processes to do that. So you've, go back to your statement, for a profitable, sustainable dairy industry. Yes. In your own words, what do you believe needs to be done so we don't see the loss of more dairy farmers, <coughs> less um, herds, less production of, uh, of milk being produced, what needs to be done? Do you want me to answer that? So, Please. so I am foremost a dairy farmer. Um, I got out of bed at 3.30 yesterday morning to get my herd of cows in in northern Victoria. Um, what I do at Dairy Australia is primarily for dairy farmers. Of course, we work with the whole supply chain. Um, Everything in this world keeps moving, and that includes farm businesses and the landscapes that they farm in. Um, and the dairy industry's changed in terms of the systems that it's running. They're more intense systems in terms of the way we feed cows. Um, they're on average larger businesses. They're trying to adapt to a very different operating environment. Australia has the most variable climate in the world. 22% more variable than South Africa, I am told, by scientists. And um, we're tackling that along with, um, you know, the natural variation of seasons and this, this rotten drought that we're all trying to deal with at the moment. There's been a lot of conversation about that this morning in this forum. And operating in that environment is, is a much rif different risk profile. Um, for everybody in the chain. And so what we're trying to do at DA, and 80% of our program spend, is towards helping farmers or working with farmers because they, they bring many things to us that we try and amplify. It's not just one way. We do a lot of priority setting. It is about how does that feed base evolve? How do business skills and the ability to plan in this environment evolve? How does the way that we use water evolve? How do we breed animals with genetics that have greater heat tolerance, that convert feed better? I mean, we do, we spend um, 10 million of that money goes annually towards um, anchoring the funding for Data Gene, which is our herd improvement organisation, for Dairy Bio, which is focused on breeding um, plants and animals for you know the environments that we're, we're moving towards and dairy feed base which has got really got an ag tech element to it and and it's about taking that technology out of dairy bio and genetics and measuring and monitoring how these systems evolve to a place where they can be more profitable that's the science end of it all of that requires that continual evolution of skills on those farms and in the rest of the supply chain in terms of what advisors do. And, and so that, that's what we're trying to do. And at the same time, stay in touch with our communities, with our consumers, with the rest of the globe as a relevant industry. And we still are a relevant industry. And we are working as hard as we can at DA to make that industry successful. We really are. And you're working hard so they can get a fair price for their milk and not the attitude, get big or get out. We talk because you said, about, you know, it's changing. We talk I know about it's changing. margin. We talk about margin improvement, trying to build margin, maintain margin in amongst all of those shifting dynamics. And of I, course, market is part of that. But market, to a large extent, is beyond the control of Dairy Australia in terms of what happens in international markets that influence Australian markets. I mean, on the positive side, 
Um, the consumption of dairy in Australia has continued to grow in line with population growth. The average Australian drinks about 100 litres of milk a year and consumes about 13 kilos of cheese. That's fantastic. We, we have a lot of milk with our coffee. Fantastic, Fantastic. with all Australian milk and cheese, Mr. Hodges. Can I just, can I just touch on mm. the cheese situation? So 38% of the milk that's produced in Australia goes into cheese. So last year, we pr produced as a nation 381,000 tonnes of cheese. We exported 166,000 tonnes of that cheese. And at the same time, imported 94,000 tonnes. About a third of that 94,000 tonnes was cheddar. And some of that goes towards um, servicing that part of the market um, where consumers want affordable private label cheese. It's just a market segment. And some processes. Um, choose to create products for overseas markets that can generate a higher margin than can, well, there's not a lot of margin in $6 a kilo private label cheese. So hmm. this, is, this to some extent, we, we all love consuming Australian. To some extent, there are some dynamics of trade here at play, and we've got processes that are seeking, at the same time, the best margins they can in a range of markets. And it's, it's known fact that there is a bit of a war going on with cheeses because they're being imported from, from New Zealand. They're a lot cheaper than our own cheese, which is going to have an impact on our own industry here. Um, that uh, some of our processes are choosing to export and grain, gain a greater margin than servicing the markets that are met by some of those New Zealand imports. That's what I'm saying. So, so just to unpack that further in terms of what that means to... that, So they're getting more money for their cheese if they send it overseas than if they sold it here in a $6 a block market. We get that. It's no different than the fishing industry. And, you know, no, like, we, we understand that. But I'm just thinking, sorry, but if it's all rainbows and unicorns, why are they leaving the land? Why are our farmers in such dire straits? Can I just ask one more question? Can I come in? Oh, yeah. Can I just come in, Chair? Sorry. So, I understand what Dairy Australia's role is, but have dairy farmers approached or requested Dairy Australia to do a research project about possibly re-regulating for a fair farm gate price? Have they done that? My colleague, Mr Nation, has said several times that is the area that Australian dairy farmers work in. No, but my, my, no, no, so, no, 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 stop, I, stop, stop. You finish? either say to me no or no, yes. My, my it's my a very simple question, Mr Dodgers. Have they requested you to do it? My understanding is, Senator, that in terms of discussions between farmers generally and Australian dairy farmers, that that conversation has been had in, you know, several pockets of industry, but the industry by and large has not taken that position and has not taken that position with Australian dairy farmers. We do no, not so they haven't taken it with you. They haven't requested for you to do that research project. No. Okay. Thank you. Yes or no? It's amazing, you know. Three letters versus two letters, and we can move well, on. Thank you, Senator. You Searle. said no. Uh, Terrific, Senator Davy. Thank you. Can I just clarify? You know, there's a lot of people here that are very keen, myself included, for a viable or a fair farm gate price. Notwithstanding the fact that it's Australian dairy farmers who are the representative body who can lobby and advocate, and, and you are a research and development arm, notwithstanding that, however, in your opinion, and I guess I'm asking you, Mr Rogers, as a dairy farmer, is re-regulation a prerequisite to achieving a fair farm gate price? Because Dairy Australia's preamble says you are working to a viable, profitable industry, is re-regulation a prerequisite to that, or do you think it is possible to achieve a fair farm gate price without necessarily going down the path of re-regulation? Dr Nation mentioned the fact that we export 
of our milk production. So that, that's an important factor to consider. Um, I think we need to look to what happens in other jurisdictions to industries that go down that pathway. I'm not, I'm not advocating a position whether I'm, whether, where I'm for or against it. I'm just suggesting that the industry and, and the country as a whole has to balance that in, in considering what creates a stronger, more sustainable, more globally competitive industry in the long run. And the export element is a significant part of that consideration. So because I, how do you get a return for that? And I think that's the important point because I want to see dairy farmers get a fair farm gate price, but I don't want to cut off my nose to spite my face. So I want to make sure that they can maximise their returns um, through whatever means possible. And to that end, so I come from the Southern Riverina. Uh, yes. I, I have quite a significant dairy region right in my home patch. Yes. Um, since the uh, issue we had a few years ago with uh, Murray Goulburn and uh, their restructure. Since then, we've actually had several new players and new processes come into the, that region, Northern Victoria, Southern New South Wales. Correct. What impact is that increased process of competition actually having on the dairy industry and farm gate prices in that region? Have um, you done any work on that? We, um, we've, we don't have it. I don't. We have. I think we have published official statistics, but it's um, we've seen significant anecdotal evidence amongst farmers that there's been some new players in the industry seeking new markets and offering to pay significant premium in the marketplace in terms of farm milk price, and they've been innovators and very successful in the regions where they're developing their business. That's um. Very pleasing to hear. Um, I, and I've also heard that some of the new players are offering quite um, significantly uh, more attractive contracts, which are making some of the older players have a rethink about how they structure their, their milk contracts. So um, I think that uh, there is definitely positives there. In your research and development work, which my understanding, the levy that you get from farmers, that's a regulated levy, am I right? So. Yes. Yes. And so that, therefore, that is the requirement that you you must use that funding on research and development. You can't use it to advocate. There's, there's, there's a statutory funding that Daryl Quinn is very familiar with. Yeah. Um, so in your research and development. Um, who determines the priorities for your research work? So, if I could speak to that. I mean, I, I think dairy actually works very well together in many ways across, across the organisations. And there's quite an extensive environmental scan done um, through those organisations, which reaches into the regions at the same time through those regional development programs to understand those priorities on an annual basis. and. Um, so we will, we will take those into account as we set annual operating plans, but particularly so as we revisit, revisit strategic plans, every uh, which have been every three years in the case of Dairy Australia, and that and that was a large part of why we embarked on Australian Dairy Plan, so that the Australian Dairy Farmers, ourselves, Australian Dairy Products Federation, and Gardner Foundation, could could essentially do that in sync um, to enable. To essentially enable ind industry to work better through this uh, flat period that we've been in. And those uh, plans, am I right, they're the plans that are broken down into your eight dairy regions? Um, uh, the regional or, development programs is one in each dairy region, yeah. yes. And they were developed because in recognition of the fact that each dairy region is quite unique. Um, yes. Like my region has yes. a large number of processes, increased competition. Other regions a, like Queensland. It's a long way from the Atherton Tablelands to the Derwent River near Hobart. Yeah. You know? And WA. And across the WA. Um, 
So what are your current priorities in your research and development programs? Our three strategic priorities have, have been um, increasing profit margin through the chain, um, working towards more capable people in the industry and social licence, which is essentially communicating with um, many, many people. So um, increasing profit, because that's what a lot of the concentration's been here today. Yes. So w what sort of things are you looking at and uh, developing that will help the farmers on the ground increase their profit? So that, to put you on this. Um, so we have a portfolio of work and uh, a lot of investment in research. Um, uh, Jeff outlined some of our biggest areas of research initiative. We see um, you know, real pressure on the cost of producing feed. Uh, feed and labour are the two biggest costs on farm. And so, uh, the de for example, the Dairy Feed Base project is a large new five-year program to try and uh, make a, a massive shift in the way we might manage feed ba the pasture, paddocks in the future, feed cows in the future, and dramatically change productivity on farm through um, new technology, big data, um, a, a, but with real practical application on farm. That's a great example of the way we invest and the differences we think we can make. Um, the, so that's an example of research. We invest in all eight regions through those re, um, regional development programs. We run a significant number of training programs and discussion groups to improve technical skills, business skills, people skills. We run things like um, uh, diploma in HR because as farmers get bigger, it's a, you know, it's a more challenging environment, employing staff, managing larger farms. Um, we um, say so that um, that combination of research and training and extension are really our primary tools for making that difference. And some of that uh, training, and particularly the business management training and the HR training, uh, that is uh, extended throughout the, the dairy industry, so it doesn't matter if you're a big dairy farmer or a family no. dairy farmer managing, you know, Absolutely. a pool of... Um, it's available, available to everybody. It's available to everyone. It's, that's one of the principles that's offered to everyone, all regions, every farmer, there's widespread access to the program. And our engagement rates with farmers have steadily increased over, over recent years. Um, we had... Uh, around two-thirds of, of farmers um, attended a, a, you know, an event, a Dairy Australia or RDP event, engaged in some way. Um, you know, the great part about that is that we want to see the highest adoption rates we can out of new technology as, as farmers are able to reach for that. I think the challenging thing in recent years is that farm profit hasn't been at a sufficient enough level uh, for quite a few farmers to genuinely be able to contemplate those changes in their business. Um, and your work is across the supply chain, am I right? So your research and development work is across the supply chain looking it's, for the end market as well as the it production It is right side? across the supply chain, but it's predominantly pre-farm gate. Predominantly pre-farm gate, right. I'm just trying to, uh, as Senator Hanson was asking about when you may get income or co-contributions from the processes, what sort of projects would that be used for? Would that be used for the projects that look at mar post-market or, or market um, end goals rather than... In terms of with the processes, that's mainly about um, innovation, things mm -hmm. that they would reach for as processing businesses within their, their facilities and their infrastructure. And it's about um, sustainability and, and you see a connection there with the sustainability framework and processes. Um, there's a, and look, we don't, I think in the past year we've spent 200,000 on those sorts of projects. There's a, one of the significant sustainability ones was around recycling and trying to move towards 100% recycling in those processing businesses. So 
it's it's a it's a small it's an important relationship in terms of the whole chain needs to work together in in various ways. Um, there's a there's a trade reference group, for example, that works with our policy people on, um, I guess you know, appropriate direction there in terms of international international um, work. Um, and also, I mean, with regards to profitability, is some of the research and development work you do also looking at how farmers can reduce input costs, like how they can reduce their energy costs, how they can, um, water is a, a very yeah. uh, difficult issue because supply and demand are not in, in sync this year, prices are very high, but also reducing, uh, reducing water inputs, reducing uh, it, energy cost yeah. inputs. Yeah, it, it is, David. Yeah, ab absolutely, it's a fundamental part of what we can do. Ultimately, farmers are much more in control of their costs than their prices, and so um, we've got we've had some fantastic outcomes in irrigation, for example. There's some substantive research that's coming out of Tasmania, and there's some big irrigation schemes going into Tasmania um, that link with energy as well, because irrigation is and can be energy intensive. So. Um, reduced energy costs of the way farmers irrigate, much more value for the water that they use, grow a lot more pasture for that water. Um, and some of those techniques to achieve that aren't very high tech and don't require that much change. So we see some of this new innovation as being very widely adoptable and can make a big difference to dairy farms. Just one you mentioned Tasmania. Are you talking about Australian-owned dairy farms or the big Van Diemen Chinese-owned dairy farm, which is the largest in Australia? So which one are we supporting? Chinese-owned dairy farms that exports two plain loads of milk a week to China, gets $9 a litre for it? We support all dairy farms. All dairy farms. Right. Um, Mr Jeff, you are a dairy farmer. I am. How many cattle do you have? Uh, we milk... 700 to 750 cows. And you're from Victoria? I am from Northern Victoria, Shepparton. Yeah, I know, I know the area, beautiful area. So you've, um, in Victoria, the, the farmers don't necessarily have to have a contract with processors, is that right? Um, that's correct, don't necessarily so have to have no one. So co there's no code of conduct? And Victoria hasn't had a reduction in their herds, have they? You maintained your basically just over a million cattle in Victoria. So you're travelling quite well, 64.3% of the herd in Victoria. Is that right? Well, I mean, the, 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 the region, I mean, as you say, you know it, it's, it's fundamentally been underpinned by access to irrigation water over the years. And mm -hmm. so we've, we've had some changes in the availability and, and the value of, of that water, and that's that's impacted all sectors in various ways, but... That's nationally. That is everywhere. Yep. But yep. we've dropped in Queensland, dairy herds have dropped considerably, where I think we've got about 80,000 in Queensland left. 80,000 in So there are the three Victorian regions and, and the two southern regions yep. are, are more pasture um, based in terms of their system, so they generally run a lower cost of production. So if you want to draw some um, parallels with the New Zealand industry. I mean, those, those two regions, and particularly Tasmania, run systems that are, that are like New Zealand and are, and are lower cost of production, and um, traditionally have been more export orientated in terms of where, where that milk has um, been sold. And um, because they're lower cost of production, have actually been able to work uh, still generate um, a margin that's enabled them to grow. Um, I said before, as you work your way north and it's drier and it's more humid and the distances are greater, it is harder to run a dairy business. It is harder uh, to generate a margin. You won't get an argument out of me about that, I know. But when we, when so, well, you we asked have me about gone from 1,500 dairy farmers in Queensland to 380, they were profitable, they were in it for, for generations, and 
because of escalating costs in electricity and water and policies and trade agreements, this is what's destroying our dairy industry. Does it concern you that you've got over 25 per cent of the agricultural land in Tasmania is foreign owned and a lot of them are dairy farms? Does that concern you? Is that an opinion, Senator Hanson, you're looking for from well, the organisation? Well, they're supposed to be for the dairy industry. No, I'm asking if, if it concerns Dairy Australia, their research and development, this is all part and parcel of it. All right. I think we should know Perhaps what is just actually a so ending quick up answer, and then I'm going to move the call around, just yeah. a few other people waiting. There are, Thank I you. mean, look, there are, there are a range of um, ownership structures um, right throughout AG. Um, various scales and funded from many different places and in terms of Dairy Australia, we work with all dairy businesses in different ways but we work with them all. The door is open to them all. All right, thank you. Uh, Senator Gallacher, you've got a question? I just have one question. I can't read your name, it's Dr. Sorry. There we go. Yeah, so still doesn't do me any good. David, is it? David. Dr. Yeah. David, yes. Uh, look, in, in light of your statement, they're much more in control of costs than their prices. just want to ask you again. Does Dairy Australia support the possibility of research or inquiry into regulating farm gate prices? We, uh, we welcome the inquiry that this committee is no, no, I'm talking about your organisation. Sorry? Your organisation. Does you Dairy Australia... Mm -hmm. Dairy Australia welcomes the inquiry that's just no, been called into the industry. Do you support, and it, you know, dairy farmers re-regulating farm gate price? Well, that's a different question. I think we, we're coming back to this position where Dairy Australia... No, no, you brought it up. You said they're much more in control of their costs than their prices. So there's a problem with prices, is there not? Isn't that your words? Much more in control of costs than their prices. Like... like that's your words. That's my words. And so that, is that Dairy is, that Australia is a, that in favour of re-regulating so farm gate prices? No, that, that, is oh. just, that is talking about a situation that um, farmers in general go through where there's... Um, the price is often a commodity price or an adjust or a pr commodity price with a premium based on the global trade of agricultural commodities and farmers work really hard on their cost to maintain an operating margin we totally agree on that what we what i'm trying to get to is do you support re-regulation of farm gate prices we don't take we you we, don't we don't no, take it's a position. an answer that's good it we doesn't don't. matter if it's yes or no i just want an answer we don't take yours no he doesn't no. take a position. Ask and answer. What is the position? Yes, we don't no. Take, we don't take a position. Okay, thank you. That's all, all I had. No, all right, thank you very much, it. Senator Rennick. Okay, uh, my question's for Jeff. Um, the dairy industry deregulated about 20 years ago. Is that late, the late that, 90s? Yes. Yeah, late 90s. So, who wanted that? The farmers or the government? Uh, that was something that farmers. Uh, had many meetings about, yep. and farmers generally, yep. nothing in this world's ever one, unanimous, yeah, generally yeah, no, supported right. that direction. Yeah, so that's important because it was the farmers that wanted deregulation, isn't it? It's an important point to make that the farmers 20 years ago in the late 90s wanted deregulation. It was, it was their decision to break up the co ops. There were, there were, well, Look, dairy farmer leaders, state dairy farmer, agri political leaders, chose to take that course, that pathway. Political leaders, after or, after, or dairy after a lot of a, I'm not, I'm a not lot of farmer arguing. meetings, that yeah. was the direction they took. Yeah, at, at the bequest of the dairy farmers, wasn't it? Well, it, it was. I mean, I, I don't think they would have um, they would have kept going that way if they didn't think they had the industry behind them. Yeah, that's that's right. So, and in in terms of more intensive, um, you know, said so the industry is more intensive. Would an example of that be um, the water irrigation um, is a lot more expensive because of the almond farmers and things like that? So things outside your industry control. There are a lot of things outside our industry yeah, control. Yeah, that's, that's I'm my saying point. farm systems yep. are more intensive and more yep. complex in terms of the way that we're needing to run them because yep. that's the sort of operating environment we're in. Yeah. That's right. Um, yeah, I agree with that. Um, and then, uh, have you been involved with uh, industry consultation um, and, and, and research of a, of a code of conduct? Um, I haven't. 
I haven't been right. involved in that because that's been run by our representative bodies. Right. How long have they been involved with that? Australian Code of Dairy Conduct Farmers Court? and and the state organisations, the state dairy farmer like like the UDV. Yep. Have um, conducted that industry effort. And how long has that been going for? That's been going for quite a few months. Uh, hasn't it? That's been, I guess, since its inception, a couple of years. For a couple of years. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Okay. That's all. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Senator Rennick. Senator Roberts. Thank you, Chair, and thank you all for attending today. Mr. Rogers, you you said Australia, and, and I agree with you totally. Has Australia has the most variable climate in the world, mm. and um, that means that we need to be more resilient to those variabilities, right? Yes, it does. Which means costs need to be lower. Um, in other words, to say go through the prolonged dry periods, which are natural, then costs need to be lower to survive. I think the challenge of that is, unless you're particularly agile and you have very resilient systems and you work across much more than annual cycles, it, it, it can drive more cost in. Um, now, we don't yep. want that to happen, but I, I think that's the part of the phase that you see dairy in at the moment as it endeavours to adjust that um, some more costs have come in, more capital cost, more, more fixed cost, and, and you've, got to, you've got to match that with increased productivity. And so our farmers across the farming sector are generally well regarded internationally. They are. And yet they've got a higher cost base because of a high, highly variable climate. That's something they just have to deal with. I think that's true. Right. So we also need more dams which will carry us through those low periods, which can be many, many years of low periods of rain. Um. It's, it's, it's not an area I've studied, Senator. Well, dams would make us robust to variability. We've got... Um, Affordable got, access to water. Is, is the key. Thank and you. Water and we, we've ended up selling off water rights to foreigners who are not even connected to the land. And that's driven up the price of water, which is essential for dairy farmers. Is that a question? It is. Robert? Does that have an impact? It's specific to certain valleys, I um, We've got, a, we've got um, a reasonably open uh, water market. Is uh, this an appropriate, like, is this more appropriate for Friday? When we've yes, got the if we come back to the... Okay. I'd, I'd like to yep. just to continue on something that Senator Hanson raised, um, and that's with regard to Moon Lake. Australia's largest dairy producer. Um, most of my questions will be relevant, but some I'll, I'll leave out because I think they're more dealt with, better dealt with by the Foreign Investment Review Board. So I'll just ask those that, and if, if they're not relevant, tell yep. me. But um, other large Chinese owners of Moon Lake, uh, Van Diemen's Land Dairy, are they members of the Dairy Australia? Contributors? Uh, not necessarily. Okay. Not We'd sure. have to take that question on notice, Senator. Do they have access to the research? I guess that so, depends on the so membership, doesn't it? Just to clarify, they do pay a levy, mm -hmm. but it's voluntary whether they choose to become a member of Dairy Australia. Okay. Uh, why, what are the factors, if you've identified them, that drove the sale of this that particular dairy to Chinese investors rather than locals? My understanding is it was a, um, a business for sale and it was a competitive process to, to purchase and the Chinese were the successful bidders and purchasers of that business. Did the Foreign Investment Review Board consult Dairy Australia about the sale? Uh, um, Senator, I've been in my role 12 months and I'd have to go back to previous records to be able to answer that question. I know the Foreign Investment Review Board is pretty heavily worked, but uh, perhaps if someone could go back to the records, please, and let me know. What uh, benefits flow to the Tasmanian economy or the Australian economy and the, and the Australian dairy industry from the Chinese purchase? The, um, as as a, um, one of the largest dairy producing businesses, there's substantial local employment 
and also substantial economic activity through the processing of that milk in Australia. So that the farm would have shut without them? I, I'm, I, I don't believe so, but I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't have an answer to that question. Yeah, Senator Roberts, I think just if you think of the meat industry, the MLA is a research body, dairy, this is the research body yeah, as yeah, opposed I, I, to... That, that's why I, I, okay, I'm yeah. culling some of the questions because yeah. I realise that. Um, how much of the production of Moon Lake dairies or the Van Diemen Land Dairy flows to the domestic Australian market? It's the, your biggest producer. Um, my understanding is that they uh, sell their milk to a, a business that does both domestic and export business. They, that this is a, um, um, the, the factories in Tasmania, the big, big, big processing businesses, have a combined domestic and export focus. Okay. Like Thank you, Chair. I'll ask the rest of the questions with Thanks, Foreign Senator Roberts. Chair, Could I just go to somebody who hasn't oh, had yes, a go yet, yet, please? Yeah, oh, Senator oh, Antwick. Thank you, Chair. Look, I'm not sure. Uh, I, I actually I was going to try and tease these out a bit earlier on just to get a bit of a line of sight on some of the basics. But I don't think we've ever actually covered how many members the um, Dairy Australia has. D does anyone have a figure for that? The, um, as at the, um, the best current or 30th of June? As at September, we have 3,580 members. Okay, and, group, and group A members. Okay, and so this was just originally for my own knowledge, but so in terms of your engagement with them, how does it happen on a day-to-day -day basis? I mean, what actually does the engagement with the levy payers look like? In reality, our most substantive engagement with levy payers is through the eight regional development programs because they're based regionally and have that local contact. Yep. Um, in any week, there's typically courses run, discussions groups run, um, activity supported or sponsored by those regional development programs. So it's it's really that regional um, organisation touch point of dairy farmers. And I, th I think you touched on earlier some of the um, some of the key uh, projects and some of the, the innovative recent projects that you're dealing with, but. Uh, I noticed from your website there are there are a few there of interest. I think I just couldn't hear. But can you just, I mean, just in, in broad terms, just so I can get an idea of some of those, because clearly there's a lot of work that gets done, you know, in your representative body and a research body and all that sort of stuff. But just so that it's on record, can you can you give us a little bit of an idea of some of the innovative recent projects? Yes, yeah, so I, um, I I did briefly touch on dairy feed base earlier. That's one That's of the our. One. Um, um, landmark projects. There's also Dairy Bio, which focuses on bioscience, genetic improvement of pastures and cattle, uh, as well as data gene that was mentioned earlier, which is a uh, herd improvement genetic evaluation um, organisation for the industry. So let's let's stop on that for a moment. Um, every dairy cow in this country, we can work out its gen genetic merit. Every potential sire, anywhere in the world that a farmer might consider using as a sire for his herd, we can work out the genetic merit of that animal under Australian farming conditions. Um, we can now do some quite amazing things with DNA prediction in that space, as well as the traditional way that we've created international linkages through um, global collaborations, what's called interval. Um, we, um, we have uh, sub substantial regional based innovation projects. I, I mentioned earlier the, the Tasmanian project on irrigation, that also that um, that location also heavily works on um, pasture production. Mm. Uh, we also have a substantive um, investment in Queensland and that looks at forage quality and it relates to the point earlier that it is harder to farm in the subtropics. So, the, so the, the, these are uh, research and development projects that you know, the Dairy yes. Australia is involved in, which ultimately have benefits which flow back to the levy payers through mechanisms like that research development, which improves the manner in which they can farm, the resilience yes. of the cattle, the resilience of the or the, the, the production levels, all those sorts of things. And that, and that Queensland example is a great example. The, um, ultimately, the challenge in Queensland being warmer and subtropical is not growing feed base, mm. so it's not quantity, it's quality. So our research there is entirely focused on if you can increase the quality of the feed, it's much more effective in feeding to dairy cows and, and that, that is one of the most successful ways we could make 
um, northern dairy industry more productive. So that's a substantial body of work that is um, with the, the Queensland State Department, also joined with University of Queensland. Uh, that's an example of R&D. We, um, we run training and extension programs regularly around the country. Um, we run focus farms. That is actually one of the more popular things that we do. So we have focus farms in every region and they do a fantastic job of opening up their books, both their, what's happening technically on their farm and financially on their farm. So, so sorry, sorry to interrupt there. These are two levy payers, so this is... These, are, these will be levy paying yeah. farmers, commercial farmers, of which they are, um, do a fantastic job of um, being a focus farm and having um, uh, an open, open policy of people coming and learning about how they're successful, because ultimately success breeds success. Um, we, um, um, we also have, um, um, when I talk about discussion groups, over 100 discussion groups countrywide. When we talk about success as well, that's been profit and success has been a big part of the theme of today's discussions. Um, we have what we call a dairy farm monitor project, where we have people go on, again, farmers volunteer to be part of it, and we have accountants and, and auditors make sure that it's, it's the genuine economic position of, of farms, and I, I believe it's now nearly 250 farms across all eight regions that we have now studied in depth. And that provides a fantastic benchmarking opportunity for people to understand um, if I'm not as profitable as I want to be, are any of these the farms achieving the profit that I desire? Yep. And that starts then the line of inquiry, what can I do to change? How could I be as profitable as that farm? So does that overflow into you know, almost an industry group um, mechanism, or it's still would you still class that as being, you know, R and D, that that kind of thing. I mean, is it is it? It strikes me yeah. as being, uh, yeah. But there there are all those added advantages as well from terms of the work you do. Absolutely. So that's um, that's what we would consider part of a development and extension. I, I just also noticed there's a, um, a a program relating to managing natural resources, which I was just interested in. Fert Smart. Yes. Um, can you just just that's probably my last question, but can you just take me through that and what it does and how it's provided you know, some benefit for your levy holders? Um, I, look, I, I have a basic understanding of the FERT Smart program. Yeah. It, um, it's a, um, again, it's, offered to, it's been offered to farmers on a widespread basis um, to, un to understand how to apply fertiliser differently and produce nutrient plans and through being more deliberate in where and how they, pr they use fertiliser they can use less fertiliser and, and potentially with less fertiliser get the same or more pasture growth. They're managing the natural resource. Absolutely, less inputs. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'm just conscious uh, the pork people have to fly somewhere. So Senator Hans, would yeah, you mind keeping your question short? Keep Thank you. <laughs> um, how, you've got nine directors, one CEO and the chair, so nine directors, so the chair is out of the nine directors. So you're the chair of the nine directors. So there's, there's, a, there's, a, there's an eight member board and a managing director. And a managing uh, director, so, so that's nine in total. There's nine in total. Can you explain to me how is the board elected or appointed? So there's a, um, the board deliberate annually on our skills matrix, which is, um, you know, ties back to the work of the business and, and the strategic priorities that we're, we're pursuing. On the basis of that skills matrix, there is a board selection committee which um, take applications for potential directors, um, interview and make assessments about uh, who is recommended to the AGM um, for, for approval. It's a, and, and the board selection committee is comprised of um, two representatives from our Group B members, so two from ADPF and two from ADF. Uh, and normally the chair of the board, I did that last year, um, not this year because I'm standing and we had another, we had our, our chair of uh, human resources um, chaired the committee from DA this year. So, so are you telling me it's in-house do the membership have no, any input in, in selecting I'm telling, who's I'm telling you that the, the industry um, form that board selection committee, um, um, or industry organisations do, and, and the voting uh, happens at the AGM. 
and is so that's the membership who pay their levies. They and actually vote the on farmers, the board. The farmers vote. The yes. farmers vote. Correct. All right. Absolutely. Can you tell me the representation of the board? Who's on it? The board. From where? Where do they come from? Okay. Um, so what states do they represent? That's uh, what I'm saying. Well, it's not. Is that a question you can on take on notice, Hanson? It's a skills-based board. Skil no. There, there what four, state is? All right. I'll put it to you. Four milk producer is directors. Is there one on representative one. from South Australia? Uh, he's, he's a milk producer who represents the industry. Right. Doesn't represent South Australia. Is there representation from Tasmania, New South Wales, Queensland, or Western Australia on it? <laughs> There's no representation. No representation it's from a either skills -based any board. of those states. So you have got no representation from Tasmania, New South Wales, Queensland, or Western Australia. But on these the directors board. all travel quite extensively and have right. networks across just the to, nation. Just to clarify, Senator Hanson, for you, um, as Mr. Odgers said, it's a skills based board, not a re uh, geographic representative board. So ADF Australian Dairy Farmers represents each state, has a representative on that decision-making body, but this is a skills-based board. So they're not coming representing a state per se, they're coming bringing a skill set. To a national service organisation. So is that okay? Are you happy to finish there? I put, uh, well, I just, you said that exporting has, actually we're exporting. Is not true that exporting dairy products has gone down year by year? Um, the percentage has changed because, of the, because the, the overall volumes dropped off and the domestic markets um, Yep, so our exports maintained. are going down. And also dairy farmers cannot collectively stop producing or supplying milk because they would trigger the Consumer and Competition Act, so they are forced to supply often below the cost of production. Is that true? Um, Senator, I think that's a technical question. I think you're asking whether farmers are able to engage in secondary boycotts or, or boycotts. Is that your question? I'm just, I'm just not sure what. Well, what, what it's basically, you're you know, you're, you're supposed to be supporting the farmers out there for a fair price for the milk, and basically they're they're controlled by organisations that you are there to actually support them. And I just don't feel they're getting the support that they need. But anyway, that's um. Whether you know that or not, do you know that it's true? Well, I mean, I've, I've talked. That if they I've don't supply, this about how cost if they of don't supply has increased. the milk to them, then they're before the consumer. And Sorry, I think the witness was just no, trying to answer. Yeah, answer. Uh, let's just finish just the answer, and then finish. we'll we'll finish then on this finish, topic. Finish, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Do you want to finish your answer? The, the whole supply chain is so diverse, and there are businesses in so many different positions. But cost of production has risen. Um, that's our challenge with margin. Can I, can I, can I, we're not familiar with ACCC regulations and able to answer that question competently in this. Terrific. All right. Thank you very much, thank Derry. You. Great to have you here. I think we've milked that dry. Uh -huh. <laughs> I've been working oh, on that all over. Now our flying pigs. Okay, thank, thank you. Thank you very much. All right. Um, Okay. Yeah. Oh no, we're doing call and then ALEC. It was what still agreed. Yeah, because of the flights. Uh, so now Australian Pork Limited, please.